Okay, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here today with Caroline Pova, um, who is an award-winning author, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and also vaccine injured. She's the author of um, a book, COVID vaccine, of several books, but um, one in particular relevant to today's conversation, COVID Vaccine Adverse Reaction Survival Guide. I asked Caroline if you would be kind enough to join, join me here for, an, for a chat. And I'm delighted, really delighted that you said yes. It's something that I'm really passionate about is how can we unify for a better, a better world that we all want and also um, uh, stop the kind of the, the, the hateful um, language which is going between different groups at the moment and just seeing how, um, how we can move past that really and start moving instead to, to what we all really want, which is you know, a world where the authorities and the people out there are telling us the truth and, um, and are allowing us to, to be able to make informed decisions about our health and about our well-being and our, and our life choices. So um, I promise you this will be a positive conversation because you were saying that uh, you were um, feeling a little bit fed up today. So oh, <laughs> how are you feeling I, at the moment, Caroline? I'm okay. I'm glad to be talking to you, but you, you just, you know, I, I put such a lot of effort into staying positive. Like it's a huge effort every single day. It's a real conscious effort. It's a conscious choice. And sometimes you forget how much effort it takes when you're sick for 17 months. Sometimes just even thinking about how long it is, is exhausting. And, it, and sometimes, sometimes I just can't do it. And the last few days, it's just been a bit, it's been really difficult. So I thought yeah. I'm looking forward to you perking me up a little bit, actually. I love the topic of your, you know, your kind of theme of, uh, the way that you're interested in people being kinder to each other and finding ways to come through this positive somehow. I like all of that. that. That's the kind of thing I really care about. And I've tried to talk about that throughout all of this experience. For me, I've always tried to communicate about vaccine injury in a way that encourages compassion between all different parties. And sometimes it feels like a little bit of a battle doing that, actually. So it was nice your introduction to me when you emailed me and said you the theme of what you'd like to do so thank you one thing which really uh, impressed me about the book that you've written is um to be honest before i opened it and had a look at it i was expecting it to be more of a kind of um a, a story of uh kind of what you went through and and your experiences and things like that but it's it's not. It's a, it's a practical guide to, for really anyone who is suffering from any kind of illness on how they can reclaim their health. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so really, like, I mean, in each section that you have is divided up with practical activities and really experiential as well. So is this something you've been involved in in a long time, this um, uh, kind of uh, helping people to um, take better care of their health and take care of themselves? Or was this more kind of due to what's happened? Um, actually, I haven't thought about this much, but there, there's been a theme of um, helping people make the most of their lives um, with other things that I've done. So many years ago, I suppose my first business, um, that was, gosh, that would have been 25 years ago now, um, was focused very much on helping people who were struggling for, for one reason or another. And out of that grew almost like a coaching business where I helped, it was women who'd gone to live in Japan at that time. And I did these coaching sessions to help them make the most of their lives. And it went through all different areas of, of your life, actually, um, personal, professional, uh, and it included health. And in, I hadn't really thought, put, kind of connected that now, but I, I did that 
before similar kinds of things but it was mostly in cons in consulting um as well as i i had a, i wrote a book my first book was was for women living in japan and a magazine that i published as well to help them so that whole theme of kind of overcoming things helping people make the most of what could be a challenging situation i have done some like something like that before but not to this extent not something that is you know quite literally a lifeline for a lot of people who are really really struggling um i haven't written a book quite like this before no i actually wrote down um i had a look at the amazon comments for your book and there was someone i'm going to say r davis or r davies i'm going to mention the name just in case they happen to watch this because um, it says this book is extraordinary. It won't just benefit vaccine injured people, but will be helpful for those in drug withdrawal and other conditions like CFS, ME and long COVID. And there was quite a few comments like that, that were just saying that this is really helpful. I mean, you've got a whole section on food and there's just so much in there that's, that's really about um, reclaiming health, reclaiming our own health. And for me, I feel that now that we're seeing that the medicines out there are not helping us, there's, there's a, a whole new kind of interest right now in reclaiming our own health and what we can do to do that. And it's very simple sometimes because you've got, for example, a whole chapter on sleep, which mm. is so important. It all starts with sleep. It always, any health, overcoming any kind of um, physical, cognitive, mental health challenge, it always starts with sleep. And sleep can be one of the most difficult things for us to get right because mm. of our lifestyle choices and things that are around us um, during our waking time. They affect our sleeping time. But it's mm. something that can be, I think, with effort, it can be fixed. And then you start then to look at all the other things. But un until we're getting decent sleep, we're not going to be overcoming anything. And also you, in the book, you talked about stress and fear. How, mm -hmm. how, how, how um, would you say that they're kind of the same thing, kind of almost synonyms, or are they in some way I, for me, well, this, for me, it was helpful to look at stress, I kind of reframed stress as fear. And I think that's a really helpful way of looking at the word stress. I think the word stress in itself can be quite triggering when you're talking about it in, in relation to a, a health condition, because doctors have used it in quite a dismissive way. And sometimes even friends might use it in quite a dismissive way when we're trying to communicate about a physical health condition and the word stress is thrown at us. That can actually increase the stress because you don't, because it feels like somebody's not listening to you and they're not um, paying attention to what you're saying about what's actually going on, on in your body. So the first thing I wanted to do was change that how change how we feel about that word stress and and do that by reframing it and the next thing um when i thought about stress so i was thinking about what was happening in our bodies when we feel what we call stress and what happens in our bodies when we're feeling stressed is the same as what happens in our bodies when we're feeling afraid of something so um that was how it all kind of came into the word fear how I realized I actually I looked at it all in terms of fear and then when you look at it in terms of fear you can then teach yourself various things and these things might be different for for other people I put my the things that work for me in there but um, you can teach yourself how to not be afraid and you can have conversations with yourself about what am I actually afraid of now and you can look at having a more logical understanding of what you're afraid of and then teach yourself not to be afraid of it um, and through that whole process you're basically dealing with stress and you can find ways to remove or if you can't remove it then to deal with stress and for me that whole process was life-changing. I was actually reading something the other day that was also saying that we assume that we have no control over our emotions but actually we do and actually, we can learn skills and techniques that help us, for example, to not feel fear 
or to be able to observe that fear but not go into it, you know, not go into the drama of it and get lost in it. And um, for me, for me, one of those techniques is meditation. What, what was one of the main kind of um, techniques that you found to be able to, to deal with that fear? You said it was life-changing for you. Yeah, um, it was quite simple, actually. I just told myself that I was safe. It was that, it was that simple. Um, I, I would, there were two things I used. The, the main one was I would just say to myself, I identified what I was feeling in my body was fear. I know that I wanted to, I needed to protect what was happening, happening physically in my body because I'm trying to recover from a serious health condition. So I don't want to put, make that worse. So I had my motivation and I would just say to myself, I am safe. And I would say it out loud several times and I could literally feel my body completely change when I said those words. And you were doing those dated like um, every time that you were, you noticed that there was an emotion of the, the, the emotion of fear was coming up. When I felt, when I was aware of the physical impact of it on my body and I, I didn't need to do it very often. It was like I retrained my brain um, in how to respond to anything that could that, that originally would have stimulated those fear feelings I've retrained it it doesn't happen now I don't get it. it you know I don't get the heart thumping I don't I don't get any of those feelings anymore it, it's so like important <laughs> so important because you were, you also mentioned in um, in the interview with Tess Dr Tess Laurie that Heart palpitations is a is a is a condition of, uh, of common for people that are vaccine injured, and there's so much now about um, you know the 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 risk of of heart you know kind of people worried about heart conditions and things like this, and there's just um, there's Dr. Corey was talking about um, the the new trend of unspiking, you know the spike protein. And how this new trend is everybody's obsessed with all these different protocols and all these different things that you need to do. And some of these things that we can do for ourselves to just stay healthy have been, you know, are so simple. And so, and they've been around for such, such a long time that what I'm, what I'm really feeling right now is that um, we need to start reclaiming our own um going within ourselves, really, like looking at our own behavior, looking at our own patterns. And um, there are, I, I'm, I need to um, make it clear, though, that there, it, it can be difficult when you talk about things that you can do yourself, things like breathing or, or you know, re rewiring your brain and, and that kind of thing. It can, it can be easy to talk about those things in a way that dismisses some physical damage that's been done. So I want to be very careful if I'm talking in about the context of vaccine injuries, then um, they, they are, it, it's not, a vaccine injury cannot be fixed by you telling yourself that you're safe, yeah. but your ability to cope with what's happening um, to your body because of the vaccine injury will improve if you are able to rewire your brain and to tell yourself that you're safe and you will also um, limit the possibility of doing further damage by worrying and stressing about what's happening to your body. If you, you take, you do those um, things to control that your mental health, but that's very different from saying you can fix it by doing this or it's because you're stressed or it's that do you, do you see? Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, I'm yeah, not saying yeah. that at all. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, one of the sections in your book is also, I've got lots of notes, so I'm, I'm skipping around, mm -hmm. is also on consultants. And so, and, and in that section, you're talking about um, different practitioners that you can go to um, if you, you know, if you are a vaccine injured. Um, what, uh, which which types of practitioners have would you say have been the most helpful for you? For me personally, um, going to a counsellor was incredibly helpful, um, and I did that. F uh, I think fairly early on. That was in in the early weeks. I recognised that I was having. It felt almost like a very physical, emotional response as well. Actually, um, so it, it 
I needed somebody to, I needed help. It was not something I could deal with on my own in the early days. Um, so that was very helpful. I found acupuncture very helpful. Um, and I found um, a functional medicine practitioner, um, the nutritional element of that. I found that really helpful too. Um, anybody who was, I, I think it's helpful if you're talking to anybody who's willing to spend that time with you to talk through what's going on um, with you rather than rush you in, you know, in seven minutes and, and get you out the door and, and maybe do a prescription because you tick the boxes for antidepressants. So, you know, you get that and then you get out quickly, which is what a lot of people find that are happening with their GP. My GP is lovely. I actually quite enjoy going to see my GP and, and talking to her. Um, but I, yeah, I would say counseling definitely really helpful for me, the acupuncturist, but a lot of it also depends on the person. So somebody who my, my acupuncturist is lovely and I love talking to her. So I got that experience, that hour, which is focused on my health was very positive in lots of different ways. And that in itself is also very healing. And so, yeah, so we were talking about how, you know, the, the, the a big part of, of this is also, you know, allopathic medicine can be very useful. What have you looked at any types of um, protocols or anything like this that they're recommending at the moment for vaccine injury or not really? Um, to be honest, um, I because I'm quite public about speaking, I've, I've been quite public about all of this from the beginning. I've been bombarded with one protocol after hundreds another. of different protocols. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I probably get something new every day. I, I probably get a new one. So I have an inbox which has hundreds and hundreds of emails from people who, who make one suggestion or another. Um, I, would, I would need somebody to go through all of them and to organise them and, to, and for it to, to be relevant to my particular case because we're all so different. And this seems to have brought, been brought about a lot of different responses from people we, we don't quite know why but we're not none of us are the same in how we've responded to the vaccine there are some similarities but uh, but none of them are the same and I'm I, I hear a lot from healthcare practitioners about things that they're claiming work for vaccine injury but within the vaccine injury community they're, they're not quite so loud about the same protocols so the is that do you know what yeah, yeah kind there of are like people who are claiming awful. that they're really really helping but the uh, the patients us we we're not we're not finding quite so much success yeah <laughs> so yeah and also because uh also with cpn we've now got there was a group uh, um, a whole collection of different mentors so people that have got different skills different modalities um uh, um, that, that, that have kind of come to offer sessions for people that are struggling with what's been happening. And modalities are different. It's all about finding what works for you. And like you said, it needs to be individualized. It needs to. And so a practitioner that will listen and get to know you and actually have time to spend with you, I think is so important. Yeah, we, we have that with um, the, the British um, support group, UKCV family. We have um, healthcare practitioners give presentations regularly, often maybe once every two weeks we have somebody and, um, and they explain a little bit about what their method of working is and we have quite an extensive Q&A time. And then people will generally work out, yes, actually, I think that could help me. And so then they can pursue that um, themselves. And that was... Part of the thing I wanted to do with the book was um, help people organise their thoughts and help people organise their research because we're spending so much time researching all these different protocols or practitioners or all sorts of different things that might or might not help. And that information is overwhelming. And, um, and I wanted to put it in a, to help people put it, something in there, put it in a format that makes it very easy for them to, to work with. The final section in your book uh, links very nicely to the UK CV family because it's about connections. Mm. And I was reading in the book um, that you were saying that for the first few weeks when, you've, when you, you had this experience that you felt completely alone. And 
I feel like this is something that so many people are going through. Um, not only people that are vaccine injured, but people that that are just feeling, and you talked about it expertly, by the way, because when I first talked to you in the Better Way conference, you were talk, uh, you introduced yourself as an entrepreneur. And then, and then you did your speech uh, at the Better Way conference. And I was just blown away. It's just so important to have this conversation because you were talking about pain and how there's so many different people out there that are struggling with pain. And when you're struggling with pain, that you, um, that, that, to get control again of your life, that you then vet, vent that pain. You didn't use that word. That's what I've been saying, you know, venting uh, at different groups of people. And so that feeling of isolation, that feeling of I'm the only one, I'm alone. Um, this is something that, uh, well, would you like to speak on, on, on the value well, of connection and also the UK CV family? Well, I think, I think um, the, just a little bit about what you said. So then that was really interesting. Um, that, and I think we find that within the vaccine injured community as well. There are I, I can understand why people who have lived with vaccine injury in the past, pre-COVID, I can understand why people come out of these kinds of experiences angry. Because it's it's easy, if you're angry, you can align yourself with another, with a group of people who are also very angry about it. If you want to stay reasonable and calm and really cope with these kinds of feelings, that feels lonelier there are less people in that space, occupying that space. So you become more and more withdrawn and, and the isolation increases. So I, I completely understand why people choose to be angry. And there have been days where I'll think, I just, I can't, the, the sadness of it all is so overwhelming. I would rather be angry. Anger is a much easier space to occupy. So I do, I do understand it. Um, but UKCV family, yeah, it's a, a, a woman called Charlotte set this up. And um, we, Charlotte was, on, as I was, we were on some international support groups. And the conversations, there's quite a few American um, support groups and the healthcare system in America is so completely different from the UK that British people were, were facing problems that were very unique to navigating the NHS. And um, so Charlotte set up UK CV family so that people in the UK could specifically talk about things that were related to the NHS. And it is the kindest, nicest bunch of people I have ever met that usually in support groups or any kind of online groups, you have people at some point that end up being horrible to each other and they're bitching and they're, you know, they're moaning about something and they don't, they fall out and there's all sorts of politics going on. And this just doesn't have it. It's a lovely, lovely bunch of people. And I don't know whether that's the nature of people who are vaccine injured or just, I, I really, I don't know. I've often wondered because they're such a kind, lovely group of people and people, they listen to each other. They understand when you're having a really awful day. Um, they put the effort into sharing information. Somebody can post something about, you know, I'm having a really rough day. And immediately a whole bunch of people will say, oh, private message me or I'll call you if you like. And I've not seen that level of support before. It's lovely. Yeah, I looked at your, I watched, uh, uh, I think, three of the videos on the uh, YouTube channel. It's so beautiful just to see the the community and the support and the positivity um because the thing that i keep saying also uh, with cpn is it's not about ignoring the problems you know sometimes we get comments saying oh it's not all about rainbows and unicorns it's like no it's not about avoiding the problems but it's about um focusing on how we can get through this focusing on you know, the positive on community, on sharing. And that's what we do. I mean, we don't, it's not, we don't just focus on the positive and, and um, it, you know, I mean, you, you've seen some of them. We're, we're very upfront about this is what, how awful things are. And probably in the videos, they, maybe they don't quite show just how horrific it is, but there's only so long you can live in that desperate space on a daily basis and at some point you have to find a way just to accept 
um, what's happened. And there is there is humour in it. We have we laugh at all sorts of things that probably some people think are inappropriate. And we were hoping with the videos, they get they're censored. Nobody, I don't think anybody can even find us. I don't think you know. Please do share it. We'd love for people to watch them. Um, but we we just want to be open and honest and just be you know this is what our lives are like we're real people don't give us names because we got vaccinated don't hate us you know whether you're pro or anti don't hate we're just human beings and we've, we've had a, something really awful happen to us but we're just normal we're normal people yes yeah, charlotte the founder charlotte Crichton, is that right yes. yeah um she was talking in one of the videos about um, you were saying that maybe it doesn't come across just how awful it is, but she was talking with humour. She was talking about how she'd had her first shower standing up um, in weeks and that she'd managed kind of five minutes. So I think that what's so, and actually that when you see something like that, it's very, very, very touching. And I feel like those people out there that are very judgmental can really, yeah, judgmental is perhaps the wrong word, that do have you know, um, uh, are, are kind of leaving negative comments about people that have chosen to have vaccines, that you can, when you see something like that, you see the humanity in it. And you see, like you said, the, the, the people are just, you know, ordinary people and, you know, dealing with it the best they can, um, but with support. And that's also um, so valuable and so many people need it right now. There's something I'd like to ask you. I don't know if you'd like to talk about this or not, but Charlotte said something which really touched me. She was talking about um, ending the regret cycle and the self-pity cycle um, and, the, and, and kind of changing this mindset to, um, and this also sound, almost sounds a little bit controversial, but she was talking about how I'm exactly where I need to be right now. Or she said, uh, where I'm supposed to be at this moment in my life. And you were talking about looking at things in hindsight and when you look back in hindsight. Um, um, how do you get to that stage? I mean, is that something that, that, uh, that is, is that something that you talk about amongst yourselves at the UK CV family? Kind of coming, well, obviously kind of how to come to terms with it. Yeah, we, we talk about acceptance and we acknowledge that we're all at different levels of that. So there's a general assumption that if somebody's in six months or less, they're, they're really, really struggling. They'll be in a really bad place. And there's, we kind of understand that when somebody says how far along they are. Um, everybody's like, different. Sorry, go on. And so you feel that it's a process that people go through then? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's uh, certain stages when you, you, you're quite angry, can be very angry. And um, and you might go with that anger. You might stay angry for quite, a, you know, people stay angry for a longer period of time than others. Um, it's not a, a constant state. It fluctuates all the time. I think um, uh, Charlotte would, she'd say as well that, you know, at that point, she on that day when we were talking, she was thinking, yeah, I'm where I am supposed to be in my life right now. But then a couple of weeks later, you you might have a phase where actually I'm I'm feeling really angry. I'm really uh, upset. And I'm, you know, something can trigger off a whole load of sadness and tears. And yesterday, I've been a bit like that the last couple of days. So um, and then I'll come out of that kind of phase and and I'll be a little bit more accepting. And, and that sadness and that grief is part of moving on to a new kind of stage of acceptance. And I think both Charlotte and I um, find it's helpful. We're the kind of people who um, it helps us if we're helping other people. So, and we find I know I definitely do. I found this with other th other challenging things that have happened in my life. I have found um, comfort and meaning when I've been able to turn those experiences around to be able to help someone else who's struggling the way that I struggled in the early days. Um, so I think yeah. that yeah, that's, that's what, a big part of it. 
that's what we said before this interview is we just, you know, would really like this to be helpful for others and to just help people. Um, and so obviously with you and with Charlotte and what, you know, Charlotte's achieved with the UK CV family as well, just directing that um, experience into something which can benefit others. Um, sometimes I think until we do it, because I, uh, I, I, um, um, well, I, I've, I've trained up in hypnotherapy and I've been doing that now for quite some time. And, but before that, I was a, a teacher. And when you're teaching in a classroom, of course, yeah, you're, and I still teach now, but when you're teaching in a classroom, you are kind of helping. But when you can see that you're really making a difference in someone's life and that you are contributing to someone, you know, uh, supporting someone in feeling happier or feeling more, more um, you know, they can breathe again. Um, it's a very different feeling. It's a very, very, um, it, it, it's, um, it's hard to describe. So I feel that, that, um, that what you're doing and what Charlotte's doing is kind of putting that energy into something which um, not only heals ourselves, but heals others as well. You know, when you go through difficult things, you we have to find ways to come out of them somehow p positively. And I don't mean that in a kind of happy, positive way. I mean, in a not negative way. So I, I make a conscious decision to come out of the difficulties I've had in my life, not angry, not bitter, not resentful. And I have made those decisions with two divorces, I came out of those, both of those thinking I'm not going to be angry or bitter or resentful. And I felt the same with this health challenge, but it's an effort. It requires a huge amount of effort every day. Yeah. And you talked about that in the Better Way conference talk as well, when you were saying, you know, people are numbing their, again, that's my words, but you were numbing their pain with uh, things out there alcohol or drugs or something which some other people are making money from because for us to to really heal ourselves is effort it takes time it takes work and it's a lifelong process as well I think it never ends so um right where was I going with this so uh I wanted to ask you about um and I think it's okay to say this because I know you've spoken about this openly in, in some of the videos that I've watched about um, a, a, an abusive relationship. And I talk about how the systems out there that are in place right now, are they don't have our best interests at heart. So if you um, liken it to an abusive relationship, if you say that those systems out there, some of them, you know, the corrupt ones, and we can argue or disagree on to what extent, you know, the, the systems out there are corrupt and abusive. But the only solution that I know of, if you're in an abusive relationship, is to walk away. And so, you know, you can fight with them, you can argue with them, you can try to change their mind. But ultimately, we have to walk away and heal and create a new reality for ourselves. And so what I, want, what I wanted to ask you was, because obviously I'm interested in, in kind of let's create a better world. Um, if we're going to walk away from some of these systems that are not serving us, um, what, what ways do you, have you, have you already been exploring? Cause you said you're interested in this topic. Have you already been exploring alternative holistic uh, kind of uh, health systems that we could, we could be focusing on or um, different ways to um, to do, um, for example, have you have you engage, Have you been interested in kind of um, whether we should have vaccines or not, or um, you know, like how 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 do you see a better world? How do you see us making improvements on on where we are right now? That's a huge question. <laughs> I know I've been thinking I've been thinking about this one a lot recently so if I just to throw that one on you but um okay. is it something is it something you've been thinking about or yeah not? I think about that kind of stuff all the time those are the big questions I think about um but 
if you if you want to connect that with an abusive relationship then the first step you need to think about actually is that people only leave abusive relationships when they're ready and everybody stages everybody people are ready at different levels and people don't realize they're in an abusive relationship from the beginning it doesn't happen straight away so there's a whole process going on there that I think is relevant to this situation. There are people um, looking at the world differently than those of us who are vaccine injured and people looking at the world differently who have chosen not to vaccinate at all and people looking at the world differently who are vaccinated. So there's, we're all, we're all in a different situation actually. We're looking at it in very different ways and people only change when they're ready. Um, so that would be the first thing. And that might help some people who, again, this comes back to anger, actually, when people are very angry at why other people don't see the world that they do. It's like, well, they, they, they don't. You need to accept that as much as um, you, you know. It, well, it's better if you accept that other people are, are looking at the world differently. There's no point being angry with them. They're just looking at it differently. And there are lots of different reasons why people are looking at the world differently. Um, so how I, well... I d this kind of feels a little, it seems probably a bit strange, somebody who's vaccinated to have these, uh, these opinions about healthcare, but I've believed for a very long time that doctors don't have all the answers and that pharmaceutical focused um, medical systems are not the answer, the be all and end all, which I know seems really strange for somebody who, who got vaccinated. Um, but it, there are, I, I go to, to anybody with any kind of healthcare um, experience or training, I go to them because they happen to have studied that. So I might talk to my doctor because of this, I might talk to an acupuncturist for this, I might talk to somebody else for this. None of those people have the answers necessarily. And none of those people have the right to make decisions about my health, I have the right to do that. And it is my responsibility to educate myself. It was my responsibility to learn more about vaccines before I got vaccinated. That was my responsibility to do that. So I've, I've believed that for an awful long time. I was vaccine ignorant. I didn't know anything about vaccines and I was um, uh, blinded by the reason I was getting vaccinated was nothing to do with covid or not because the government was telling me or anything it was because i wanted to i needed to do some volunteering overseas and i thought i would need it for that um so it, it's so i my my thought processes now have gone even further than they did before so before i didn't even look at the doctors to have all the answers and it's just gone further down the line there but it this is still very much a process for me i'm still learning an awful lot of things. I'm more in a stage now where I kind of, I think, I, d I, don't, I don't believe much anymore, but I don't disbelieve. I've kind of, I'm trying to find it difficult to explain this. It's such an interesting question that you've asked and I'm struggling to explain it. I probably haven't um, talked about this much before, but when, when something happens to you like a vaccine injury and you start looking at the world completely differently because something has happened, you research it, you find out things that you never even thought were true, that you find very difficult to believe at the beginning. And it's quite traumatic that understanding that the world is not quite how you thought it was and learning kind of accepting all of that is really quite difficult. And, how do you then move through the world knowing that everything you thought you knew wasn't true? It's a mm. really, really difficult position to be in. Mm. And I'm at the stage where I've said, if I can see it in front of my, in front of me, if I can see it with my own eyes, then I'll believe it. But anything outside of that, I, I reserve any comment on, which might sound like a cop out, you know what? That's, that's where I am at this stage. I, that might change later, but at the moment, that feels like the only way I can continue navigating through the world at the moment. If I can't see it right there in front of me, because I don't trust the the sources of information that are around me, I know that the media lies now, 
And that's the only way it feels I can move forward at the moment. I'm sorry if that probably wasn't a very good explanation. No, it's a wonderful explanation. I, I want to say uh, that, um, so well, what I feel is that you were talking about, you know, we've got different um, COVID camps, if you like, or different, different worldviews on, you know, there's people out there that, um, well, there's so many different ones, right? There's people in England now generally think that COVID's over. If you're living in Australia and Canada, you're still in the middle of it. Um, and then there's also people that, you know, are that think that um, we, we all have a duty to get vaccinated. There are others that are now injured. There are others that never wanted to get vaccinated. One thing that I think that we've all, and, and you're absolutely right, I totally agree with you, that we should all be allowed to have our own points of view, because otherwise, if everybody thought the same way, there'd only be one human being. So, you know, we're a, we're a mixture of different people on this planet. And what we need to do is just, like we're doing right now, is just talk to people, talk to each other and get to know each other. And, and, and yeah, get to know each other is the main thing, connection. But one thing that I think brings us all together is... Um, so the, the, the side effects, the adverse effects of these vaccines are slowly now coming out into the public. It is coming out um, about the, the extent of the side effects. And when that happens, everybody is going to go through this process of realizing that what we thought was reality is not exactly our reality and everybody is going to be go go through this you know the what you're describing now these um dealing with that fact of realizing that what i always thought my whole life was just the way that it is is not actually the whole truth and what people forget in these different camps is that we're all in a process of peeling away that onion you know, getting down to the truth of or learning, ev evolving as human beings. And so just taking away that blame, because everybody is always learning new information. And the people out there that are blaming people for, you know, you've talked about this kind of being stupid or sheep or these horrible um, uh, hate speech, really, towards different groups of people. That they're forgetting that they were once unaware of this information and judging people because they don't know what they know now and also assuming that they have nothing else to learn. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel like this is a process that we're all going through. And you talked about how um, we can, uh, um, it was your choice. Uh, you, you believe in your choice to do, you know, to, with your body what you wish that's maybe i don't know if i'm being naive but that's maybe where we could all unify around autonomy autonomy over our own body our mind and our spirit regardless of what we think otherwise as long as we don't harm others i told you i thought about it a little bit but do you does, does that um does that resonate in any way like yeah, the, it does i mean i th i try to Come, come out of there. I'm trying to come out of this. Whenever I feel myself feeling angry or feeling upset or, or, you know, why doesn't somebody understand something? I stop and I tell myself, most people genuinely want to make the world a better place. And that is the reason most people got vaccinated. Most people who didn't get vaccinated, that's probably the reason they did that as well. And even down to people who are doing the vaccinations, there are people who are doing the vaccinations who genuinely believe that they are also helping to make the, the world a better place. And if everybody genuine, most people genuinely believe that, then it, we, we shouldn't necessarily be consumed with anger. We should be trying to understand each other's perspectives. And, and if you're trying to understand somebody else's perspective from a position of compassion, then you're already making the world a better place, even if it's somebody you don't agree with. And uh, I agree with you totally. And if we did um, try to understand each other from a place of compassion, we would probably be getting to the truth much faster because we'd be, we'd be, we'd, we'd, we'd stop because there's nothing worse than someone who's got their opinion just throwing information at you. 
it never, never, never works. It doesn't matter what you're preaching about, you know, whether it's religion or science or whatever topic, if someone's just throwing information at you, you're just going to switch off. It's, it's, it's compassion and connection and empathy. That and often is... people say to me, what, and they're people who have chosen not to vaccinate and they're perhaps um, what you consider to be activists in um, related to, to vaccines. And, and they say, you know, what can I do to help people who are vaccine injured? I want to be helpful. And I say to them, stop speaking with anger. You need to speak gently and kindly and softly and you need to listen more than you speak and that way people then will feel safe to be able to talk to you about what they're dealing with and just creating that gentle safe space for other people to talk you're you're being incredibly helpful but just by doing that people won't yeah. listen if you're if you're somebody being very angry and shouty about your beliefs Somebody who is vaccine injured will not come to you broken hearted to, for comfort. No, absolutely. And it reminds me again of the Better Way Conference talk when you were talking at the, at the end, when you were saying that you were, you know, you were, I think, sitting and I don't remember if you were, uh, anyway, someone came over and just kind of put their hands on your head and just were just there for you with with no judgment just there for you and that that's that's i think yeah i i really hope my 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 positive takeaway is that um yes i believe that where we can come together on this is that we should be demanding the right for us to have freedom to choose what happens to our body and our mind and our spirit and nobody else should be enforcing that on anybody else. And uh, although we're going to have different opinions on things, I do hope that this is where, or I don't hope I'm putting it out there that this is going to happen, that this is where we can come together is around this. Because uh, like I said, you know, those different camps that we've talked about, um, this is this, this realization of the, of the vaccine side effects is one one thing which is going to to hit all of the camps, and um, and uh, and and so then in the end maybe we can just say we just don't want that anymore. Is there Caroline? Is there anything else that you'd like? Because we, we, I'm going to ask uh, people that have joined us today if they've got any questions, and um, or and also if people would like to uh, check uh, to kind of check out more about Caroline and Caroline's uh, uh, many books. How many books have you written? Um, seven. Seven different books. Yeah. Uh, but also the COVID vaccine adverse reaction survival guide, which as I said, is not, it's, it's a beautiful guide for everybody that's interested in healing themselves or just being, um, de yeah, especially kind of dealing with um, physical, and uh, an emotional, I'd include emotional kind of problems and disease and things like this. It's just really practical for so many different reasons. But anyway, the, you can go to carolinepover.com. And yeah, so I'm going to open this up for questions. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, kind of say about maybe what you're doing now or what you're focusing on now or any other links or anything like that? No, um, the ukcvfamily.org is the link for anybody um, who wants to know about what we're doing. If you want to donate to the support group or if you know anybody who's vaccine injured and they need support, then send them to us. We'll, we'll do our best to help. And also there's the, the letter to my MP documentary from the UKCV family. Yes, yeah, so um, that's uh, we contacted it's just over 180 MPs who are um, their constituents or our members. And we actually got quite positive responses from about a third of the MPs. So um, a lot of people talk that Sir Christopher Chope is the only MP that's listening to us. He's not at all. There's about 60 other MPs that are helping their constituents. They're aware of vaccine injuries and they're doing their best to, to support us too. That's another important point is that not everybody in the media is, you know, 
conspiring. Not everybody in politics is conspiring. There are good people out there in all professions. And this is also something which I think we need to remember. Yeah. Perhaps I'll just quickly mention that you, you did mention that you're focusing with the UK CV family on media, medical professionals and MPs. So is that still your focus at the moment is, um, is contacting those groups? Um, we have done. Um, we we haven't done a lot actually recently. The media campaign we didn't get very far with that actually. Although we did have somebody from mainstream media um, contact us. Uh, he was wasn't even in his. He couldn't contact us from his office. He said he'd lose his job if it, if they knew that he was speaking to us. So that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, uh, so, and the medical profession, we haven't had a lot in the medical um, medical support, but we do have some healthcare practitioners who give presentations, like I said, um, every now and again. So that's encouraging. We need that encouragement, even if nobody's got answers or you know, any solutions right now. We just need to keep people going because mental health now, not just a, a physical problem. So. Yeah, I didn't ask you or talk to you about the, uh, the the vaccine injury symptoms and things, and that was deliberate because um you know it's it's bringing up you know trauma and things that we don't need necessarily need to think about but if anybody is interested in that then uh, you did discuss that with uh, dr tess laurie in her interview with you and um and also a bit more of the history of which i didn't mention the uh the the natural disaster in japan that you were um that you've been so involved with and helping those people there in the community i also didn't want to upset you by bringing that one up no, no, but, <laughs> but that's also uh you can also find out about some of your philanthropy through the um the interview with tess there great all right so um now i'm going to then just open up two questions uh from the people here andrew you've just joined us at the end of this um discussion here so we're now on the questions at the end but people feel free um david you are already unable uh, sorry able to unmute yourself if you'd like uh thank you so much uh caroline i've been i've been pronouncing your name for an hour <laughs> um <laughs> One of the reasons, uh, Caroline uh, and Robito, uh, I made a point to be with you here today from Montreal, is my own process of uh, really wanting to be able to reach across the aisle um, uh, to to those, to, I, you know, red pill, blue pill, I don't want to go there, but who chose to follow um, their own intuition and chose to to comply with the government mandates. And my own personal obstacle to that is um, here in Montreal, we're still seeing about 20% of people outside wearing masks. And I get triggered AF um, when I go by and see them. And it's internal. I get I, like, really? Really? Um, your compliance will destroy all of us. This is all internal. And then I shift to, well, it's not their fault. They did what they thought was best. It's the system. And then I shift to, it takes me about three or four degrees of internal processing to land in my place of compassion, which is my, my default nature. So I, I'm constantly going through this process and I want to be able to um, speak with those people without this um, triggering still live in me and see if we can begin to have a conversation. Because I think that is one of the most important things um, that we transcend these ideological camps of the purebloods who did the right thing and the compliant who, who didn't and just move past that and find some common ground to speak. So I'd be really curious to hear uh, your take. Um, what do you want to speak to them about? Um, I, I, like the first thing I would want to do with the, those who are still wearing masks outside is help them understand that they're, they're making themselves sick. So um, you're going into that conversation wanting to change their point of view and wanting to tell them something that you believe. That might be my flaw right out of the gate. Well, that you want to switch everything around. The purpose of a conversation, this is just my opinion, purpose of, and the way that I've dealt with these kinds of things, 
go into a conversation wanting to understand more about that other person, not for the purpose of me getting my point across. And yeah. I think that will help you. I would say that we have to understand, like we, we've got to get to this point where we understand that, um, accept it, even if it, even if it, you know, we've got our own personal points of view and, and, and we want to get them out there. And I've been there, I've been there, uh, a long time before CPN, I had a different project called Wake Up World Education, and it was all about trying to get people out there to critically think about what's going on in the world. And it never works. It doesn't work. Trying to get somebody else to understand what you believe, it, it doesn't work. That, that, that direction doesn't work. It has to come from a place of uh, genuinely wanting to understand where the other person is. And also, I would say, acceptance of people that will not agree with you. My mum has had two vaccinations. She's got fibromyalgia. She's uh, overweight. She's got uh, half of her heart doesn't pump. And, um, and I spoke to her about not taking a vaccine. And she said that for her, it was it was she preferred to take the vaccine than risk get COVID. And I had to, in the end, just accept that it's her life, it's her choices, it's her story. And, you know, and we get on really well, so we can also joke and laugh with each other. And over time, you know, we start to, you know, I could, I could understand that my mum was, you know, she was thinking, she was using her brain, but she just didn't have the same information that I had which was that the, for me, in fact, she was high risk. So even if the COVID wasn't that dangerous, um, you know, for most people, she was a high risk person. So I, 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 I understand, okay, yeah, she's not, you know, the, some people kind of think that, that people that don't, do, don't realize what we realize are in some way stupid or inferior or not using their brains. But um, but you can see, no, there's thought process has gone on there. It's, it's, it's a different perspective. And, um, and through conversation, she's decided not to get a booster. So um, this is the, I agree totally with And if you've gone into those conversations with your mum <clears throat> from a very kind of aggressive, wanting to change her mind point of view, then um, that, that gradual change in her thinking might not have happened that the I conversations did, I, would have stopped a long time ago if you'd communicated in that way i did that before once and she said and she shouted at me and she said i've seen it on the telly i've heard it on the news stop ramming it down my throat <laughs> and then we laughed about it because we have a good relationship but yes it was uh, i'm not interested you know this is this is a block you are now blocking me um, it, it never works. We have to be genuinely interested in understanding the other person. I think it's a it's a big it's a big ask. I'll use the UK accent. It's a big ask um, to unplug the agenda and just be in compassionate curiosity. Because I I know how my mind works. Uh, I can fully be compassionately curious, but somewhere lurking down the road is an agenda I want to lead them to. Um, and it's a tricky one, Car Caroline, uh, because um, their compliance will be my demise. But you don't know that. And you, uh, you have your own agenda then. Well, I, and I owned it right here. I own that I have an agenda. Yeah. Um, so it depends if you, if you want to be part of a world that where compassion is is a priority, which is the world that I'm choosing to be in. I don't always get it right, but I, I try really hard. That is going to be that I have to be that world. I have to go out there and have to put out that energy. And I have to, I have to walk the talk. If I want people to be kinder and I want the world to be kinder, I have to be that. But there is something else which, which, which we could also consider, which is that, um, Prior to this whole mess, people were relatively comfortable with, with the things, the way that things were going. And the way that things were going was not um, uh, constructive to 
you know, it's, it was dis destroying the environment. Scientists are saying, you know, there's going to be no more uh, fish in the sea in so many years and things like this. So we could say that if we want to progress and consciously evolve as a species, that it might be possible that everything that is going on right now is contributing to that evolution. Um, in order for us to get off, up off of our sofas and stop watching Netflix, we need things to get bad because we need that, that motivation to go out and do good. So, I mean, it's a very, um, maybe it's a, well, anyway, so that's also one thing which I consider is perhaps all of this is just necessary for us to just take us where we need to go. <clears throat> and that takes away this whole idea, David, of what you're saying is we're, uh, we're all doomed. Maybe we're not all doomed. Maybe, maybe this is all part of a process for us to consciously evolve as a species so we can do things better. And that helps me instead of this idea of we're all doomed. I, if thinking about that, if we're all doomed, I mean, the people in the vaccine injury communities, we, um, some of us will talk openly about it, some of us don't, but we all think about it and we, we think about whether our time is up. And this is something that feels very real to many of us. So if you think that your time is up, whether it's because you're doomed or you know, humanity's doomed or whatever, whatever it might be, when you think that your time genuinely might be up, do you live your life differently? Are there things that you do? And none of us are gonna live forever. So during those interactions, limited interactions we might have with people, do we want them to be argumentative or difficult or do we want them to be full of love? Can I come in? Yeah, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to apologise for coming in sort of so late, but this is my first ever Zoom meeting outside my normal little group of people. So um, just um, apologise for that for a moment. Um, a little bit about me. I run a company called Power Change, which is all about personal development. We call ourselves the personal development service, and I've been doing that for 25 years. And before that, I was really into belief change big time because I was an evangelical happy clappy pastor. So really, when you stop and think about it, beliefs has been my life. Um, but I, uh, coming back to all these things, and I'm an NLP master prac as well. So um the question I'm asking, and I'd like to know, is do you know anybody who does anything at any point, has any conversation without some sort of agenda? I don't think I don't think any of us can actually have a communication without having an agenda. No, there is something we want. And it might be acceptance, it might be love for that person, it might be wanting them better, it might be wanting them dead. Uh, you know, all these sorts of things are but slipped into all our lives, it would seem to me, is acting on purpose. And that purpose, I guess, is agenda-based. What do you think about that? I would say, Caroline, while you're thinking about this one, <laughs> I would say that um, uh, you're probably right. And therefore, we need to choose what our agenda is. Is our agenda one that is going to promote a better world or is our agenda one which is going to make it worse? And certainly with CPN, I'm very aware that I'm presenting a particular narrative. I don't have that narrative planned. It's very fluid uh, and, just, and just changing and happening as, as we move along. But that narrative has become that um, we are unifying that we are going to create a better world, that we can um, uh, um, start communicating with each other and joining online events and, and build a community. So I am presenting, you could call it an agenda, I call it a narrative. Um, but the focus of that narrative is about connection and love and compassion and making a better world. So I would say that it depends on, uh, you know, we choose which agenda. So, yeah, listening to David's comments earlier, I'd have thought he 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 genuinely has a a concern for the people around him. That's his his genuine love for these people who are still wearing masks is there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the anger or whatever would be the best way of expressing that. But I, you know, it seems to me that you know, for me, uh, you know, I, 
absolutely I want people to to live a good and full and happy and Andrew I'm watching people and I love humanity I'm a well-being facilitator this is what yeah, I funny do enough I'm not really a people person per se I like all the technology of what goes on in people's heads <laughs> but I'm watching these people harm themselves it's not an opinion yes it's not yeah. an opinion David I would probably suggest that if you, if you say that to yourself in a different tone of voice you'll get a different response you know, if you were to, if you were to look at those people and just simply say, "I don't want those people to harm themselves," well, this it, this conflict actually happens internally. I'm 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 in control. Yes, of, of course. Enough. However, I would still say that. So I just sure shared my voices. internal process, my yeah. internal process, and and I'll tell you, uh, I don't like the taste of even my process in my mouth. Yeah. That I that I I have to work through the triggering, yeah. and I understand triggering and anchored and try and all that. This is what I do for a living, but I go through it, yeah. and so I'm just being really uh, uh, transparent here and sharing my process. And uh, more often than not, I choose just to drive away and love them, yes, because I don't know yet if I can enter into a compassionately curious dialogue with my agenda fully unplugged. It's interesting and, isn't it, how we come back time and again to asking the question, what are my personal values? You know, you know, is grace something that I want to operate with as acceptance? You know, we never change a person by making them wrong was one of the things we had hammered into us at the NLP course. I'm not sure that's true, by the way. But, uh, you know, by making a person feel that they're wrong, you just entrench them even further in the behaviour that they've established. And um, I'm Andrew. sorry, I'm a guest here. I ought to be asking. No, no, it's fine. I'm just going to stop you there, though. <laughs> because, a question here. Um, because, but I'm 71. Uh, I've, been, I've been around uh, a little while. Andrew, Andrew, yeah. just one second. I just want to check with Caroline if it's okay for us to continue so long. Caroline, yeah. I'm so sorry. All right, so <laughs> it's okay. All right. So um, it's a very interesting conversation, Andrew and David, but I'm going to stop it here. Can David and I continue our conversation outside this environment? You can stay here if you like, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll um, yeah, I'll make David into a, 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 a the host because I trust him. Not that I don't <laughs> trust you, Andrew, but I've met I've met David before, uh, and then you can just close the meeting when you're ready. Brilliant, um, Caroline. Susan, can I just Susan? I'm just reading your message, your the the message that you put in the chat, and that's really lovely, and that makes me really happy. Thank you for sharing. Let's have a look. I didn't see that one. Uh, thank you for this session. It was very important conversation. Beneficial for all of us to check our lower emotions, our anger, frustration, and our disappointment. And I've lost it now. We need to observe them and release them consciously, withholding judgment by really listening to others and accepting them where they are. I've been angry for so long since I woke up to my new worldview. Now I feel so much better as I appreciate more and more. And thank you for allowing me to join this very informative discussion from Loophole. And thank you, Susan. That's a wonderful place to finish. Caroline, thank you so much for this interview. And um, yeah, I'm really sure that this is going to be helpful for a lot of people. Thank you for everything that you're doing as well. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we, should, we can stop now. Okay. Uh, uh, cheeky and a little bit mad. Uh, love it. <laughs>